Welcome to this morning's program, Coffee with a Curator, The Power of Women in Country Music. Um, my name is Stacy, and I handle adult education here at the museum, and we're so glad that you're spending your morning with us. Uh, a few quick housekeeping items. We ask that you please keep your mics muted throughout the entirety of the program, and to please type any questions that you have for our speakers into the chat function located at the bottom center of your screen. At the end of the program, I'll ask our speakers as many of your questions as time allows. So it's my honor to introduce and welcome this morning's speakers. We have Kelsey Goals from the associate, who is the associate curator at the Green Museum LA, and we have Michael Osman, who is the curator of decorative arts here at the North Carolina Museum of History. So, Michael, I'm going to turn things over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Stacy, and welcome, Kelsey. Nice to have you this morning. Thank you, Michael. It's great to see you again. So I'm going to start you off with one of the big questions. Uh, <laughs> why did the Grammy Museum decide to do an exhibit on women in country music? Well, back in 2018, when this all got started, there was a study done and it looked at radio play amongst country music all over the country. So they noticed very quickly that only 10% of the songs being played on the radio were performed by women, the rest being men. So us at the Grammy Awards and the Grammy Museum are noticing that Casey Musgraves is winning album of the year and Taylor Swift is selling out stadiums across the country. So we decided to ask the question, why are these women being celebrated all throughout the music industry, but not on the radio amongst country music channels? And we thought it was time to shed a light on the women of country music and all of their amazing contributions to the genre throughout the last hundred years. So that's what you see in your gallery right now. <laughs> Take it all the way back to the 1920s and showing that women have been making their mark on the genre throughout. Right. And it's, and it's really interesting um, that, you know, Roy Acuff, one of the male stars, said that he said never tour with a with a woman musician because you know she could never sell tickets or records. Yeah. Uh, so that's that truly is not you know not the case. Right. Um, There's a great living history in the gallery with Kitty Wells where she talks about that. Right. She right. One of the and first. So I, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned Kitty Wells because Kitty and Loretta and Casey Musgraves and and even Dolly Parton and Gene Shepard, they sang some songs that were a little bit uh, ahead of their time. So can you talk about, maybe talk about the songs a little bit and talk about the what they, what they had to battle? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one of my main points in putting together this exhibit as it continues to grow over time is that women are extremely fearless with their songwriting. And that's exactly what you just mentioned. So from the beginning, when Katie Wells was putting out singles, you know, they're telling it like it is. They say that country music is three chords and the truth, but a lot of the male counterparts are singing about the same things time after time. So I think when Loretta picked up a guitar in the 70s and started singing about uphill and what that did for her family and her life, and then Dolly Parton started singing about what it was like to be a woman in the workplace, working nine to five. And then fast forward to just, I mean, a, a couple of years ago, a decade ago, you have Casey Musgraves talking about LGBTQ rights and how you can kiss whoever you want to. Like They wow. weren't afraid to disrupt and poke at a lot of conservative ideas, which is obviously very typical in a lot of country music circles and they knew in a lot of cases that would get them banned from the radio and ignored and <laughs> pushed out of a lot of circles right. but they were willing to take that risk to to be who they really were and sing the song sing the songs they really wanted to sing and i think right. that's so daring. Yes, it's <laughs> so scary to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, yeah. I know Loretta Lynn was was banned from the radio for a while, but look at her now. She's she's well, everyone's. Also, you know, the Dixie Chicks, you know, with yes. their political standings. 
Yeah. But, um, yeah. So that got it, them, you know, blacklisted right. for quite a while, and now they're back and, you know, right. stronger than ever. <laughs> right. um, one thing too, I always love to point out to people, you know, it's it's so much more than the the glitz and glitter and rhinestones. Dolly would probably disagree with that. <laughs> but um, kind of talk about, um, you know, that, you know, like we we know the Nashville look and how, you know, and the Nashville sound, but how these women are not cookie cutters. You know, they've created, they created their own look and their own type of music. Uh, so maybe talk a little bit about that. Sure, I think when you walk through the gallery, you can tell right away, like, there's a, some things in common and some things that are so non-common. And there's so many different types of women, whether they're different because of where they're from or how they look or what they sing about. But yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of grit. <laughs> and I think you're right, Dolly would say that there's always room for more rhinestones. <laughs> but uh, something we really wanted to show with this exhibit was that not only are these women superstar performers with their fantastic fashion sense, but they are playing the instruments, they are writing the songs, right. they are fighting the fight, like we just talked about. And, you know, they might go home and be mothers too. <laughs> like right. They're so extremely multifaceted. And like I said, fearless. And I think right. that just takes their music to a whole other level because then whether you're a man or a woman listening to those lyrics, you can you can feel where they're coming from and believe in what they're saying because they've lived a lot. <laughs> right. I'm glad you also mentioned about their different cultures are expressed in their songs and um, uh, and their dress. Can you speak about it's it's not just the Nashville kind of uh, sound that we were used to in the 80s and 90s with all the newer people coming in. Can you talk about maybe like all the different mixtures of music that is making up country music now? Yeah, I think we have this section all about the next generation and also the North Carolina section. And obviously the history in your state is so rich with old time music and bluegrass and Americana. I think country music is like this huge umbrella for so many different sounds. And a lot of these women either start out country and then take a turn into bluegrass, gospel, Americana, or they start in one of those offshoots and then get kind of lumped in with country. And sometimes they collaborate with each other and that makes it even more country. But <laughs> I think it's really exciting that you can have someone or like a group like our native daughters where they're all playing a banjo. They all come from these rich backgrounds and different types of bands like Allison Russell and Amethyst Kia and Rhiannon Giddens. Yes. And it all blends together to create something new. And I think that's what the next generation of country is, is kind of this melting pot of country influences and Southern music. And it doesn't all sound the same when you hear it on the radio 10% of the time. Right. <laughs> um, and there's there's something in there for everyone. You know, I think country music is super inviting. So what whatever way you find yourself there listening to those artists, like you're going to find something that speaks to your story right. and what you grew up around. <laughs> like talking about real life in a real yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, one part that I really found interesting uh, that I didn't know was going to be in the exhibit um, was the the songwriting section. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really cool section to have added. Uh, if you can talk about that. Sure. Well, at the Grand Museum, we love to shine light on the creative process, whatever that means. So handwritten lyrics, you can sometimes see where people crossed out a word and picked a different word. like. We love to show kind of how collaboration and creativity start real small and then become something much, much bigger. And then awards come after that. <laughs> so especially considering 
Nashville and the function of Nashville as like a songwriting hub for a lot of country music. We wanted to show that some of these female superstars you know so well started off behind a desk writing a song. And some of them never take the stage. Some of them are just purely career songwriters. I think it's so interesting that that's like a career track you can take. Right. And so many of them sit down together and just work through lyrics and, and verses all day long until they have the perfect, perfect catchy tune. <laughs> so we wanted to show that, yes, people like Dolly, people like even um, Diane Warren writing a song for Leanne Rhymes or some of these new gals from the next generation, like they all start somewhere. And that is with songwriting. Yeah. And I, I've listened to some of the interviews and it's and it's really interesting when you know some of the artisans will write their music they actually have oh this I want this to be for Casey Musgraves or I want this to be for Dolly and it's like they know in the beginning it's when it's when it's free flowing that creativity they know who they kind of want to sing it sometimes yes yeah or sometimes maybe not at all and then somebody picks it up and you never would have thought it could have been somebody else's song because it's so perfect the way they do it and I think there's a, um, there's a songwriter in there called Nicole Galleon. She is a big writer, but just put out her first solo album. And she talked about sometimes just picking one word and letting a song come from that. So it's interesting to think like, maybe you start with a phrase or a word or a performer in mind, and you can start a song off so many different ways. Mm-hmm. That's true. It's very cool. Yes. So... Going back in time a little bit, mm-hmm. um, today we we don't, you know, we don't even think about that these stars are, um, these women musicians and stars are, are just, you know, they'll just hop on their bus or they'll hop in their car and they'll take off to a venue uh, and just go. Um, but that was not the case for the early stars at all. They just couldn't take off and go and do those things. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, I, I had the great opportunity to speak with Wanda Jackson when we had the exhibit in Tulsa, and she has a fantastic memoir. And I loved hearing her stories about how like, she started off with a radio show, just like 15 minutes every couple of days. She started gaining notoriety, so she would tour locally because you would at first only be known as far as your radio signal could reach. And she would hop in the car with her dad and drive to the next towns over to perform. And I think, you know, you keep going farther and farther and your radio signal reaches farther and farther. And then suddenly you're a well-known face, a well-known name. And that takes you really far. But I mean, I'm talking about the 50s right now. (laughs) So then let's fast forward to say the 80s or 90s, you get Reba, you get Dolly, you have people debuting on the Grand Ole Opry. So again, that started off as a radio show, as many of us know, and then it turned into a television program. So then suddenly if you can see Dolly's face on TV, I think a lot of young girls were sitting at home watching that program and saw a blonde woman, (laughs) young and beautiful, singing her songs. And a lot of girls said, I want to do that too. I can do that too. And then even a little bit later, you have music videos. And I think that gave women an opportunity to not only show their their faces and sing their songs, but like add their sense of style and tell a story. Right. Some of Reba's music videos are like little soap operas. <laughs> yes, they are. Everybody loves fancy. I love that. Yeah, exactly. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah, I love that question. And you know, it's it's like the older stars, like the Carter family that you'll see in the beginning, and Patsy Montana and them, um, um, with you know, I want to be a cowboy sweetheart. They couldn't travel on their own. They had to travel with men. Oh, Women yeah. couldn't travel alone so women were were so limited by what their male counterparts um prescri- prescribed for them right and now they can go off and do their own thing without without anybody's approval which i think is really is is really cool to think about 
Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. A lot of women started off as the sideshow right. for the male star, even right. all the way to the, the Porter Wagoner show with Dolly kind of on the side. Yes. It took her a long time to get out on her own. Right. And, and you know, I'll, I, I love to say these quotes, but, you know, there's the quote from Hank Williams mm -hmm. you know, who said, you know, we're talking about all of this success, but, you know, you know, Hank Williams is not that far removed from country music. Um, but, you know, his, the older Hank Williams Sr., you know, said that there was no place for a woman in, or a girl in country music. It's crazy to think about that. I know. <laughs> You'd think it that, is. like, it would be like today where everybody is like, oh, everybody's welcome. Everybody should get on stage. But times were so different back then. And things were the way they were <laughs> right and so but these women was, had to be so much braver right to right force their way onto that stage there was a great story you told about a musician um and they'll get to see if you know y'all need to come and look at this exhibit because there's one great artifact that has a fantastic story and that is about a guitar case so can you talk to us about the guitar case that's in the exhibit? Yeah, that is one of my favorite pieces. Miss um, Kaylee Hammock. She is a young rising star, red hair, <laughs> amazing songs. She's toured with Reba. She started out in Nashville and her house, unfortunately, caught on fire and a lot of stuff was lost but she said as soon as she found out that her living room basically was on fire she prayed for about seven things to not be burned by that fire one of them being her guitar and some drafts for some songs that she hadn't finished yet so in the museum you'll see this guitar case that is a little charred on the edges when we pack it to send it around, we have to wrap it real carefully because little parts will fall off. Right. <laughs> but that guitar survived and it was the first guitar her father ever bought her. And she had a chance to come by the LA Museum when Power of Women in Country Music was installed here in LA. And she got really emotional when she saw it there because she said like that was almost a hard stop for her career, but she right. was able to rescue those pieces and keep going. Yes. I think it's it's such a symbol for resilience in so many ways, right? <laughs> yes. And so there's another guitar that I really like. Uh, it's pink. Oh, yes. Uh, so if you can talk about that. And then if you could also talk about this uh, special banjo that we have in the exhibit as well. <laughs> yeah. Those two are right next to each other, aren't they? I love them both. Yes, they are. Much. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Ms. Wanda Jackson did a signature acoustic guitar with Daisy Rock Guitars, which is a female-owned guitar brand. And she said, you know what? I want it to be pink. <laughs> and I think the color pink is like so uh, assigned to women and it can right. define women. And I think um, that might be limiting to some, but she felt empowered by it. She's like, right. I love this color. It makes me feel proud. And excited to get up on that stage and rock out. So I, I love that her yeah. signature guitar with her signature on it is bright pink and it's real cute. And Miss Dolly's banjo, we know Dolly Parton, she keeps butterflies around, she keeps flowers around. She's very decorated at all times. So this banjo is absolutely stunning. Not only is it lined with rhinestones, like just about everything else she touches, but it has butterfly inlay all down the neck and the head of the banjo. And for both of these instruments, I just think like these women owned their femininity and took it onto stage with them as if to rub it into these men's faces that they are women and they are performing country music on that stage. So I think for them, it was, it's like an armor. It's yes. a badge of yes. success. Like I'm here, I'm a gal and I'm going to, rock your socks off. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there's another section of instruments uh, off to the side. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a group of them all together. And um, 
you know, there are some in instruments that some people may not be familiar with, um, but they actually get to touch those instruments and, and using things that are different than what you normally do. You know, like when Dolly Parton said she would do her fingernails together like a typewriter. So can you talk about that sidewall and all those other uh, instruments? Sure, sure. I wanted to isolate the instruments of country music. And of course, I probably missed quite a few, like a pedal steel or, you know, a few other percussion instruments. But I think country music just sounds so unique. And there's so many instruments that go back so far in American history and global history that have just like the sounds they make it immediately remind you of country music. So I'm talking about a banjo, talking about a dulcimer, an auto harp. And we wanted to let our visitors and especially kids kind of see what they look like, be able to touch and feel how it feels to hit those strings and push those buttons. And then there's a corresponding kiosk where you can hear that sound by itself. And I think that kind of I love inspires. That. I think that's yeah, so it inspires close listening because how fun is it to listen to a band play but be able to hear that banjo solo and how special it is because right. you know what banjo sounds like. So I know it's a bit nerve wracking to have people touching items in a museum, but those instruments have not been played by famous country music superstars. Right. Right. They're just for us kind of to explore and get the hang of and isolate. And there's one thing that people used to wash their clothes on. Can you talk yes. about that? Yeah, there's a washboard. And, you know, it seems like a, a laundry tool, but it is a percussion instrument. And I think you hear washboard and country music, but also uh, Zydeco and a lot of really fun Southern music. And it's just... You grab a thimble or a fork and you just go to town on that thing. You wear it on your chest. I think it's a really unique percussion sound. Um, and I think some gals like Miranda Lambert and probably Dolly played washboards live. Okay. And it's really fun to watch, especially if they have their long acrylic nails on. <laughs> hey, <I'll see> this. <laughs> so on a much uh, lighter note, <laughs> um, you know, we we see everybody with their Grammy Award yeah. uh, smiling and holding it. So there are a fun few facts about the Grammy Award. Can you talk about that? Yeah, the Grammy Award has gone through a lot of changes since the beginning of the, since they were first given out. So the Grammy history goes all the way back to 1959. And over about five iterations, it has grown in size. So it looks really big on TV. <laughs> uh, there's a unique metal alloy called Gramium that they're made out of. So we have our own metal. And one part I think is really fun and surprising is that the horn screws off when you need to pack it up and travel it. Cause you know, that arm comes out quite far and <laughs> right. yeah, so it's fun. You can take it off and wrap it separately and listen to it <laughs> but I think it's an iconic award and everybody yes. recognizes it around yes and I think you said how many people only make those one person makes them wow yeah gosh. yeah there's a gentleman in Colorado and he took over for the person before him so okay. he apprenticed um but the current gentleman's name is John Billings and he has a workshop and he makes all of those Grammys every year. So when you watch the Grammys on TV, they're placeholders. They get to hold them and take their pictures and give their speeches, right. but then they go home and a few months later, their personalized Grammy comes in the mail and that's yeah. theirs only. You can't sell them like they are one of a kind. And yeah. Okay. Well, is there anything that you would kind of like to end up with that that you would like to say? I think we covered so much great stuff. I, I would say that one of my favorite things in the entire exhibit is Shania Twain's Man, I Feel Like a Woman outfit. <laughs> Talk about that one all the time. It was yes, such a, yes. a great piece to add in there. And I think just, you know, how we were talking about music videos before and we were talking about 
owning your femininity with a pink guitar, she kind of took these, she took menswear, you know, she's wearing like a tuxedo jacket and tie and a collar. Um, and she, she spun it on its head and she said, I'm going to wear the men's clothes and I'm going to sing the country music and make it all my own. She turned it into pop rock and she created a video and an album and a moment of country music that I think people are still talking about. And I love seeing that she's kind of making a comeback right now and putting out a new album. And she has such a great story, but I think those pieces really embody the whole show. Yes, it's great. Well, I did I did want to mention thank you so much for sure, your time you. and so the Grammy fun. Museum. And it has been absolutely great working with y'all. I mean, y'all have been available for us at a moment's notice. Gosh, thank um, you. So it's it's been amazing. I did want to mention one thing before we leave, talking about all the different kinds of music, mm -hmm. uh, but the museum here um, has a series called our Southern Songbird series. And uh, we have those for people, if they will keep checking our website, we will have upcoming uh, shows. Um, but that's a really that's a really great series uh, because we're we're getting recognized musicians, but we're also in the spirit of the exhibit. We're also honoring those musicians who are starting out, you know, or who are in the beginning or the middle of their career. So they they get you know if people come to these, they get to see a lot of different and hear a lot of different voices and a lot of different styles. So I think that's pretty cool that it ties into the exhibit that way. Yeah, keep the tradition going. And you guys also have a great North Carolina section that highlights women from throughout the history of country music who were born and formed in North Carolina. And it was so fun to work with you guys to put that part together uniquely for your museum. Thank you. Thank you, it was great. Yeah. All right, thank you guys so much. I just yeah. have to say really quickly on the Shania Twain note, Shania Twain was my first big concert. Oh my gosh. And Amazing. so she literally showed up on stage in leopard print, like head to toe. And it was just, it changed my whole life. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I think she's iconic for a lot of us. Um, okay, we've got a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, how did the notion come about that women could not or should not sing in country music? Um, was it based on myth or tradition or male domination of that field? Any feedback? I think male domination in the field and just like antiquated gender roles. There was a lot of things that people said women couldn't do that they ended up doing. <laughs> so, you know, just most women would probably have been at home with the children making a home and some women decided they wanted a career and sometimes that career was in country music. So somebody had to kind of do it first to show that people after them could do it too. Yeah, and depending on their, their social or their cultural constructs, you know, they weren't supposed to do those things. Right. Um, so they really had to step out on their own and kind of make their mark and not be afraid. Um, and so many did do that. And I think to me, the most amazing part about this exhibit is that togetherness. You know, you don't see that in the male side of the industry. Right. You know, if if one musician had a hard time and she went through that, then she'll help the next person. And then that person helped the next person. Absolutely. So all this togetherness and they all helped each other make it happen for each other. And I think that's what's so important. They had they had these roadblocks, but yet they helped each other jump the hurdles. 100%. You still see it today. Like Brandi Carlisle just hosted an all-female music festival. There's all-female writing sessions. Like, And that's why we situated the exhibit chronologically, because you can see each barrier getting broken down right. and the ladies pulling the next group, group of girls up. <laughs> Um, our next question is, was there one song that brought country music into the mainstream music scene, or do you think there were several? Oh. It's a tough one. I, I would think there were several. 
And I think we kind of touched on a few of them. You know, you're going to get your your nine to fives, <laughs> your your songs that just kind of break through any kind of genre um, bucket. And then, like I said, in the '90s, there was this country pop revolution, and suddenly pop fans can be country fans, and country fans can love pop, and got rock and roll in there. And yeah, there's all kinds of mixing and collaborating and sometimes gospel comes into it right yeah hard to pinpoint one song I have to think about that one <laughs> so you think about Taylor Swift as one of the yeah, newer, yeah. you know artists you know because she was totally country you know yep. and then she went pop and now she's kind of folk and now she's kind of folk country pop everything yeah, those crossover artists right. who kind that's, of that's all this blend music. Yes. the lines. Yeah, <laughs> that's actually she is actually what our last question is about. Um, it said that Taylor Swift seemed to get a good amount of attention in the exhibit, um, and that this person thought of her as more of a pop artist. Um, and kind of what served you on that, Kelsey, in terms of her being one of the few who successfully has kind of you know yeah. switched sides back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, she's a, a great supporter of the museum. We're very thankful. So she was willing to lend a few dresses. And I think it shows her growth within and without the, the genre. So we all remember when she had that curly hair and she started out as a country singer. <laughs> I think a lot of these women started out as country singers, like I said, and then they continued to explore their interests and write their songs however they feel like. And that sometimes takes you in other directions. So. Yeah. When I talk about country being this big umbrella, sometimes you might step out and step back in. <laughs> so it's it's really fascinating to watch what she does. And I think she's she's not necessarily making country music anymore, but it it's it was her diving board. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so, so much for your time this morning. Kelsey, thank, thank you. you for getting up super early on the way on the West Coast. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> <laughs> to join us and thank you Michael for, for jumping in and, and doing us for this, this with us this morning um, and thank you to those of you who joined us for this program today um, if you haven't already gotten down to the museum to see the power of women in country music exhibit we invite you to come on down um, we thankfully to the Gray Museum LA are going to have it through the end of March so you have some time to come down and enjoy it and see all the great things that Michael and Kelsey have talked about this morning. Um, we'll see y'all later. Have a good rest of your day. Bye guys. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Bye.